Hello and welcome to a short history of OERs. Wait, what even is an OER? OER is short for Open Educational Resource. It became popular around the turn of the millennium. UNESCO defines the term like this. Open educational resources are teaching, learning and research materials in any medium digital or otherwise, that have been released under an open licence that permits no-cost access, use, adaptation and redistribution by others with no or limited restrictions. What this means? OERs are actually older than the term. The very idea of OERs builds on a history which reaches back many millennia and ultimately coincides with the development of the web. To get a better grasp of OERs and how to understand their current development, let's take a quick look at their history. Around the 3rd century BC, the Library of Alexandria was founded in ancient Egypt. It's said to have been one of the largest and most significant libraries of the ancient world. However, not everyone could benefit. Access was restricted, probably to scholars and the wealthy. They allowed academic freedom and, additionally, the sharing and copying of materials. But copying meant handwriting on papyrus paper, so it took a long time. Then, many, many years later, typesetting came to the Western world. It reached Europe in the 15th century. This marks the beginning of what we call the modern ages. Of course, most people didn't have direct access to a printing press until, in the 20th century, the photocopier arrived. Then, in Switzerland in 1989, something world-changing was invented. The World Wide Web. It was originally conceived to meet the demand for automated information sharing between scientists and universities across the world. The web went public in the early 90s, and soon everyone with internet access could publish anything at any time. Never before had there been such a conflict between what you could, what you should, and what you were allowed to do with educational materials. There are very good reasons why some materials shouldn't be openly shared, not least because authors need to be able to make a living. Also, assembling these materials takes time and effort. Somebody has to do it. So obtaining a copy requires payment. But then there are others whose job it is to produce materials, perhaps using taxpayer money. One could argue that publicly funded documents should be freely available to the public. And that was the position of the American National Science Foundation when they funded the development of educational materials. But that was pre-web and the argument was complicated by the need to have publisher-based distribution channels. It came back into focus, however, in 2002, when the term Open Educational Resources was coined by UNESCO, which brings us back here. This coincided with the start of MIT's Open Courseware Initiative, one of the most influential OER actions. There were others, some of them morphed, but many of them were short-lived. Then came the next big thing. The New York Times declared 2012 the year of the MOOC, with the emergence of massive open online courses. The idea was that customers would line up in huge numbers. The hope was that they would pay with massive amounts of data about learning, an educational data mining operation, so to speak. Unfortunately, however, this bubble burst in 2021, when one of the largest providers of MOOCs was sold to a commercial company. The end.